Okay, I want to talk a little bit about scriptures and so-called scriptures that really um, got in my way from finding the truth. First, the first thing that got in my way was the Bible itself, and it wasn't the Bible's fault. I just didn't have uh, a real understanding of what was going on in the Bible. I was um, 11 years old, reading the Bible by myself and nobody to talk to about it. And um, God sounded so mean that it would make me cry. It wasn't until many, many years later that I learned what the um, context was. I had no sense of the context. And I think most people don't have a sense of that context. And what I discovered was Genesis 6. I think it's Genesis 6, 4? It's Genesis 6, 3 or Genesis 6, 4, where it talks about how the sons of men thought that the women were very comely and they decided to mate with them. These were the fallen angels, the sons of, the sons of God referred to in the Old Testament were the, the angels. Um, if you do some research, you'll find that's true. I can't explain it very well, so I'll just let you look it up. But the Son of God is Christ Jesus, but the sons, plural of God, were the, um, the angels, whether they were fallen or not fallen. And I think the reason they were called that is because they were created by God. It wasn't even a man and a woman reproducing, but he actually made each one of them. And so, uh, and he made them at least somewhat, I guess. I, I don't know if they made, if he made them in his image or not, to tell you the truth, because I think, because I know there's different kinds of angels. But anyway, when they say in, in the Bible, the sons of God in the Old Testament, that's who they mean is the angels, uh, whether they're fallen or not. But the sons of God who had fallen, um, and by fallen I mean they had rebelled against God, at, at the, the, the leader who's now often referred to as Satan, he, he was very beautiful and he became very prideful and he wanted to, he got to the point where he just thought he was, he got too big for his britches, way too big for his britches, and he decided that he wanted to be uh, worshipped instead of worshipping God. And um, he managed to lead a whole third of the angels in heaven which is a whole lot. I don't know how many, but it's a lot. He led them to rebel from God. And um, anyway, in Genesis 6, what we discover is that there were these um, fallen angels that mated with human women and that there were giants in those days. And Genesis 6 doesn't really go into much detail about it. But what we find out today which I, by the, all the signs, we're clearly in what's called the latter days. Things are going really fast, and a lot of the things that the Bible predicted um, are happening. And one of the things that Jesus had said when he was asked about how would we know when it was we were coming to the end times was he said, it'll be as in the days of Noah. Well... Genesis 6 is in the days of Noah, and that is um, when the flood, he, when God decided to have the flood because he was repenting from even having created man because they had gotten so evil, um, and this was, a lot of this was because of the taint, they were tainted by the rebellious angels that would, um, they had, the angels, they have, I guess you could call it powers and knowledge much beyond what 
regular humans have. And they, they knew, they set themselves up as gods. And um, when they, they weren't supposed to reproduce with humans, and they knew that. And what you find out in the book of Enoch, which Jesus himself mentioned Enoch, so did his, um, I want to say, I, I say that really surely, but I'm pretty sure he did. His brother Jude definitely quoted Enoch, the book of Enoch. And um, Enoch is also mentioned in Hebrews as well as in um, Genesis. So this Enoch was the great-grandfather of Noah. And um, what we find out is that from the book of Enoch, which does not co contradict the Bible until you get to chapter 108, which is the very last chapter, which was added on later. And um, a lot of scholars are really, who do accept the book of Enoch as being inspired scripture, um, they, they're not so sure about chapter 108. But anyway, the first 107 chapters are um, pretty darn close to scripture. And in fact, it was kept as scripture in the Ethiopian Bible. They were the um, only church in the world that decided to keep the book of Enoch, even when the, other, the others who were deciding about which books to go in the Bible decided against putting the Enoch in. And um, I think that worked out perfectly. I mean, it's obvious that it did because when you read the book of Enoch, the very, and this is just the first book of Enoch, there is no second and third books of Enoch made by that, by the great grandfather of Noah. The other two are, are imposters and antichrist. It's not even worth reading books two and three unless you're a Bible scholar and you already have a solid knowledge of the Bible, then you can read it just to help warn others. Anyhow, the very beginning of the book of Enoch, it explains that it was written for the people in the latter days. And that's us. <laughs> We've been elected. <laughs> and um, so the book of Enoch let, let's us understand that a lot of things about what was happening with those fallen angels that there was 200 of them and they all met together uh, at the top of Mount Hermon in uh, Israel and um, one of them was saying hey you know I want to go you know mate with this human woman we, we ought to go do this I'm, I'm kind of scared to do it by myself. Why don't we all make a pact and we'll all do it? it gave, they kind of gave each other courage by deciding to do it together. And I think they were figuring, they were probably thinking, oh, you know, God's, God will understand. He might get mad at first, but then he'll forgive us. Maybe that's what they were thinking. I don't know. But anyhow, uh, when they did that, and oh, what I wanted to say about angels there, we know from the Bible, which is all true, it's, it's the Holy Bible, King James or the Geneva 1599, there might be one or two little, little small errors in it, but really it's very good translations. All the other ones I'm not gonna, st I'm not gonna, um, vouch for because um, there have been changes made where in some Bibles some things have been taken out, some things have been added, but you can pretty well trust for the English translations, the um, King James Bible and or I do, I trust them both and if I have a question of one, I look at the other Geneva and King James anyhow where was I? um Oh, so what happened when these um, fallen angels 
oh, the angels, what they were able to do is we don't really know exactly how they did it. But um, there seems to be a lot of indication that angels, if they were just showing up in their regular, hmm, regular body in, on earth, they would probably be a whole lot bigger than we are. And um, I think this is why, even though they transform themselves, I think this is how they did it. I think they transform themselves to being like human size in order to mate with the women. And um, they, I don't think they're capable of staying in a human body for a really extended amount of time because in the Bible, none of them ever did. They would come, they would do things, they would look like regular men, but a lot of times people could tell they were angels because, um, oh, I don't, I'm not gonna say how they knew because there could be different reasons. But anyway, um, When they mated with the women, the women had babies, and those children grew up to be giants. That's where you get people like Goliath and Taller. Um, we don't know exactly how tall those giants were, but a lot of bones have been found all over the world of giants, and they've been hidden. I think it's the... Um, conspiracy of those fallen angels who want to rule the world actually and want to be it's one in particular is going to end up be doing it and he wants to be like treated as God and wants people to obey him and uh, one of the things the main thing he wants to do is keep people away from Christ Jesus because that's really the only weapon that mankind has um, to fend them off. We don't have their intellectual prowess. We don't have their supernatural powers. Um, and we don't have the ancient knowledge that they have. And, but we, but as children of God, as long as we accept him and love him and obey him, um, we have total protection, or, well, pretty close to total. <laughs> there have been a lot of martyrs, so anyway, this is all a temporal world, and when likes to think that anyone who's been martyred was willing to do that or they wouldn't have put themselves in that position and we know from the Bible that anyone who is martyred for Christ has a very special reward in heaven in their in, in, in eternity and they certainly deserve it anyhow these uh, the, the, their offspring were giants and what happened to the women, we don't really know. It could be that they died in childbirth, or it could be that the angels had a way to have them have premature births before the women would be harmed by birthing such a large child. I, that's not really covered. I don't know. But anyway, um, the thing about these giants and these the children of the fallen angels with human women is um, they were just evil. They were just mean. Um, they were very violent and were even cannibalistic. They ate not only people, but each other. They ate a lot. <laughs> and I guess they would run out of vegetation and well, I know it sounds like I'm telling a fairy tale, but unfortunately or fortunately, whichever way you want to look at it, I really believe this is true. And it's a very fascinating thing to look into. You can find books. Um, uh, 
Uh, there's one that's like an encyclopedia of the bones that have just been found in the United States over the last 200 years of giants. Um, and at first the Smithsonian used to admit it and um, I think there were even some publications that came out where the Smithsonian would mention the giant bones. But pretty early on in the 20th century, suddenly the, the Smithsonian clammed up and didn't anymore. Um, and it's believed that that's when the Freemasons kind of took over the Smithsonian. Um, because the Freemasons are all, some knowingly and others unknowingly are in on this conspiracy. That's whoever they're taking, whoever the ones who are taking the orders, they're um, taking orders from, ultimately, from these fallen angels. And, um, geez, I know it sounds like I need a tinfoil hat, doesn't it? But these are things that I've been learning from years of study at this point, and um, that I really believe, I believe it's true, I absolutely, and I believe that the reason that the Book of Enoch was um, kind of kept hidden for a while was um, because it's, it's, it's a pretty wild story that we really need to, to hear about in the latter days, and if we hear about it before we're dealing with some of this crazy stuff we're starting to already deal with, we'll be more prepared and we'll understand how much we really need our God, our Lord. And, um, you know, Jesus, he came and, and, and made it a lot easier for people. It used to be that before he came, the way I understand it, a person had to basically sacrifice themselves a lot more to to um, show their true repentance and obedience to God and um, people were having a lot of hard time doing that and so God sent his only son which is really a part of him Jesus himself is God it's just that he's what some people refer to as the triune God. He's the Father, Creator, Father God, which is a spirit. He's the Son of God, which is fully God and fully man. And he's the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, which is something that begins to live inside of us once we have turned to Jesus and that's when he, he will give us our, the Holy Spirit and he will also, and then we, can all, we also get baptized. And um, as a representation, we immerse in the water and, and come back out and it's to show that we become a new person. We were once dead and then was, we become alive because the death warrant is already out on us when we're born, because we're born into sin, we're born into a fallen world. But once we turn to Jesus, we're given life again. We're, able, we're, we're given eternal life. And a lot of people think and there were rumors that started right away after it happened. A lot of people think that Jesus was not really crucified or that he didn't really get raised from the dead, that he didn't really raise from the dead three days later. But there's actually a really good book out called The Case for Christ. And um, I highly recommend it to anyone who doubts that Jesus either really existed or that he was really crucified or that he really resurrected because um, you don't have to only believe the believers. You can also, there were also a lot of um, people that wrote about Jesus and about 
the things that happened in those days that were not believers and um, well it's a whole book so I'm not going to try to tell you but it's a good book The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel who um, actually got this information when he was trying to prove to his wife that Jesus didn't really exist because he was an atheist and he loved his wife and he was worried that her becoming a Christian was going to ruin their marriage and um, he was very astounded to learn that <laughs> before it was all over he himself became a believer so and then he actually ended up becoming a minister so anyway he had been an award-winning investigative journalist for the Chicago Tribune I think that was back in the 70s anyway um, What was the topic I was talking about? <laughs> Combination of it being late at night and my short-term memory is not as good as it used to be. I think I wanted to talk about scripture, yes. Because when I first became a believer in Jesus, I didn't know much scripture at all. And I did start reading the Bible and I was reading the King James and I loved reading it because I had fallen madly in love with Jesus and I wanted to know more and more about him. Um, but I didn't really get that far in the Bible before I was um, starting to remember other books like, oh, the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ. That one has Jesus in it and it tells about the other years that they don't talk about in the Bible. And I still, I still had a lot of New Age beliefs, and wasn't I didn't think of them as New Age beliefs. That's what I think of them as now. Um, and so I started like, oh well, I can just add to my reading about Jesus by reading these other books too. And boy, that was a real recipe for confusion. Um, because those were really not those those are not good books to read it's basically another deception from the fallen angels um, they want to teach another Jesus that's what Paul referred to it he says if you ever hear someone preaching another Jesus than what we're telling you then beware that's a false prophet those are false those are false and um, what the fallen angels want one of the things they want is for people to just think of uh, themselves kind of the way the fallen angels think of themselves they think well I'm a God or God's inside of me and um, that way you you can go the direction that they went and turn away from God even though they've been told in Enoch there's in the book of Enoch what you discover is that the angels got kind of really worried after they had mated with the human women they were kind of they found out that God was well they knew that God would be really mad about it and um, God is so pure that only those who are not doing things that he finds abominable can even really be in his presence and communicate with him it's kind of like he's like he's the real light and uh, darkness can't just like walk in and talk to the light because darkness isn't there um, he's so pure and so he can only hear from us um, when we're being really in alignment with him and, and coming from a really pure place and that's how Jesus helped so much because um, he gave us the way through him and he he sacrificed himself for us just the way you would how you know a father or a mother would so a mother or father who really loves their child 
give their life for their child. And this is what Jesus did for us. Anyhow, um, I started reading things like the Aquarian Gospel again, and, and uh, oh, some of this, I don't even want to list these books because they're just ridiculous, but I started reading different books and, and getting a little bit confused, and then I started getting a lot confused because I got to a point where I guess I felt like I didn't need the Bible to read about Jesus because I had these other books I could read. And I was reading one day in the Bible about fornication, which basically means sex outside of marriage. And you're not supposed to do it at all. And I had already been doing it, and I was already, I was so comfortable with it, and I didn't think there was anything wrong. I'd never thought there was anything wrong with it. And I, um, I finally came to a point where it was, it took, it took about a year before it happened, but I came to a point where it was like, well, wait a minute, I, this is, I live in the 20th century. At this time, it was still the 20th century. This is the 20th century. This, the Bible was written such a long time ago for different people in a different time, and there's, you just can't tell people, you know, in 1984 that, that it was actually 1983 that everybody became a Christian. You can't tell people in 1984 that, that they can't have sex outside of marriage. That's just unreasonable, is how I thought of it. And um, so I was putting my own, my own um, perspective above, as if it were above the perspective of God in the Bible. And it was very, um, I can't think of what the word is, but it wasn't a good thing to do. <laughs> it was a very bad thing to do. Because the once, I, once I decided that the, the Bible couldn't be right, it was like, well, if it's wrong here, it could be wrong in a lot of things. And so I stopped reading it. And... Um, I had not had good experiences with different churches, so that wasn't an answer for me. And um, I, uh, it wasn't too long before I was just going my merry way, thinking of myself as a Christian, still loving Jesus, but I wasn't, I wasn't doing anything to kind of keep that connection. And I even forgot to pray. I wasn't praying anymore. And I basically ended up in many ways in the same situation I'd been before I'd become a Christian as far as just not really having a direction and, and not really um, having his guidance, which was, was one of the greatest boons I could have had but did not take advantage of. And um, I just, I got involved with, I had been gotten involved with a, a guru who later didn't want to be called a guru. He wanted to be called a master, either one. It wasn't good. If I'd known the Bible more, I would have known I wasn't supposed to do that. But instead I thought, oh, well, I think maybe because of some new supernatural experience I had, I thought, oh, well, I think maybe Jesus is trying to tell me that that I should follow this guru because he, he probably represents Jesus for today because the guru did not give us any, he didn't tell us not to have sex outside of marriage. He didn't, he didn't tell us a lot. He didn't tell, even tell us not to do drugs. He didn't tell us not to, he, he didn't tell us a whole lot. He was pretty much an anything goes kind of guru. And I, I really believe that that is a big part of his appeal. Anyway, um, I still thought of myself as a Christian. In fact, that guru would say, well, if you're a Christian, you can keep being a Christian. It'll just, I'll just, by your being involved with me and doing my meditation and, 
and serving me. He would never put it that way. He talked about himself in the third person. He'd say, and then if you serve the master, then um, I guess he thought that made him sound more humble. And to the really gullible of us, it did. Uh, anyway, um, if you just listen to me and serve me and meditate with the meditation techniques I give you, and don't tell anybody else the techniques because they're just too important and, and either I or one of my representatives needs to be the one to give them that. If I'd known the Bible, if I'd understood the Bible more, I would have stayed away from him. Because, for one thing, Jesus made it plain that he's not into doing secrets. If you're in any group where they have secrets that you're not supposed to tell anybody or not supposed to tell anyone until they're in the group, that's a big, huge red flag. Um, and, uh, anyway, I think for me, I know for me that was part of the reason that I got along so well with following him was that I got to make all my own decisions still almost all you know I I served him and I listened to him and I meditated and then outside of that I thought okay well I thought that was my armor I thought that was my armor of God and that anything else I did I had full protection oh no um, that's not how it worked out. Um, but I think I've already made this um, video a little too long. Um, but I just want to say that when I finally came to realize in 2013, 30 years after I had first accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I was astounded to realize that I had turned away from the Bible for that long and um, I started and I started praying a lot and I prayed for discernment a lot and I searched and searched and I searched Bibles and I was astounded by the choices of Bible translations I don't know there must be 200 of them out there by now and in, in English and um, it's like, how was I going to pick which one? And I was so passionate about, I'm never going to lose my connection with Jesus like that again. That It's not that I ever totally lost connection with him because I can see how he was there. He was keeping me alive through all my foolishness. I don't didn't deserve it, but he did. And... Um, I... Uh, I wanted to really, really read the Bible and really understand it, and and I and just like a lot of people think, I thought, oh, the King James, it's too archaic, just like the same thing I used to say about the Bible itself. And so I can understand it better if I read a modern version. And so I went out and I got so many Bibles. I spent hundreds of dollars on Bibles, which for me is a, a fortune, and. Um, only to finally find out, especially helpful for me, were uh, Chris Pinto's documentary series. It's um, the first in the documentary is called A Lamp in the Dark, free on YouTube. Or you can buy the DVD, which is even better uh, to do that, to support Chris Pinto and his uh, Adulam films, because he does a lot of good films. Um, and the second one was called... Uh, Tears Among the Wheat, which for me was the, both the first two were both blockbusters for me. They really were. And then the third one, Bridge Over Babylon, that one got real more intellectual. And uh, I, I, I don't know that I, I, I don't know about that one. I really don't think I got as much out of that third one anyway. Um, it really helped me understand the importance of the King James Bible or the Geneva Bible because those are the ones that used the they both used the same manuscripts 
and um, the uh, in the late 19th century there were two men named Westcott and Hort that edited the Greek text and when you say the Greek text when it refers to the Bible we're talking about the New Testament and one can tell from uh, letters that they wrote to each other and different things that they were spiritualists they didn't even believe that Jesus did miracles um, and well it was just all part of the fallen angels design that's what I really believe um, and you'll find that most Bibles today do not use the same text as the King James and the um, Geneva Bibles. I really like the Geneva Bible um, a lot because the, the men who translated that were all doing it at a risk of their lives. They were very had a very passionate love for Christ and um, I just know that they were coming from a really pure place and actually one of the main reasons as I understand it that King James decided to have a new translation made was because he was concerned that people might not keep believing in the divine right of kings because the um, Geneva was the first Bible that started getting to, into the hands of the common people and um, it had a lot of study notes and in those notes it said that if the king or the pharaoh is telling you to do something which goes against God's laws then you're right to, to um, refuse to obey the king or pharaoh and um, I think that that's probably the truth that's probably the one of the main reasons King James wanted to have the Bible translated again where they wouldn't have those study notes and and uh, but at the same time um, there's a lot of good things about the King James um, so I like them both and um, it's harder to get a good copy of the 1599 Geneva at least in hard copy with large enough print to make it easy to read for people like me who are having a harder time as I get older reading the, the, the small print. I really wish they would put it in two volumes where there'd be one volume of just the scripture and then a separate volume of the footnotes so that there would be room for larger print. Anyhow, um, once I got back into the Bible it was difficult. It was difficult for me because um, I really, really wanted to, to obey God. I wanted to not be rebellious anymore. I realized he was right about forn fornication all along. And, um, but there was this thing about he, it was obvious he did not like women to sleep with other women and men to sleep with other men sexually. And although I never identified as homosexual, there are people in my life that I love very much that do identify that way. And I just couldn't, I just didn't want to accept it that God wasn't okay with it. And I tried my best in my own way to twist the scriptures. And um, I didn't see it that way at the time. But I just thought there's got to be, a, there's gotta be a, a, an error in translation. Or I just couldn't believe God would say that. And I even went to a church that was, um, I was one of the only straight people, um, one of the only people that was just a heterosexual uh, that went to that church and I did it because I wanted to be supportive of um, homosexuals and transsexuals and, and all of that and um, I was really upset that that most of the churches were saying it was not okay to be homosexual I thought that was unloving. 
It took me a long time. It t I'd say probably until 2015. It probably took me t two years before I had part of it was the, uh, a supernatural experience that I believe definitely came from the Holy Spirit where they were having a prayer meeting at that church I was going to and the, uh, the gay, he called himself gay, uh, pastor was speaking in tongues but the way they did it was very chaotic because different people in the room would all be speaking in tongues at the same time and um, you could I, I would just listen to him because um, I'd be sitting in the front row and I'd be near where he was and, and I recognized his voice and and he would always interpret whatever he had just said in tongues. And this one time he did it. And I, I would go to those, um, even though I didn't speak in tongues. I, I did one time in my life speak in tongues. But for me, it's not something that I can just go, okay, I'm going to speak in tongues now. It doesn't work that way for me. And um, But it did happen to me once. And I do know it's a real thing. I also know there's a counterfeit of it from the um, from the fallen angels. Oh, so one of the things that's important to understand that you come to learn from the book of Enoch is what are demons, what are devils? The kind that possess people, that they talk about possessing people and all of that, those are actually the spirits of the children of the giants. I mean, not the children of the fallen angels that were like giants. And one of the part of the punishment um, of God in Enoch, he explains that they um, um, well, they don't have a chance. They don't have a chance to ever enter the kingdom of God, and they're they're basically kind of stuck in the second heaven, and um, we're in the first heaven. They're in the second heaven, and the third heaven is the top heaven. So, anyway, um, so they have nothing but hatred for us, and they, it's, it, it, they're the ones who will sometimes come through people and be like speaking in tongues, but they're really speaking in their own demonic tongue. And, So anyway, um, I was listening to the pastor, and he had just spoken in tongues, and I couldn't believe what he said next. And the, like I said, there was all these different people doing it all at the same time, and I was specifically listening to him. And I don't know who everybody else was listening to, but there's at least 30 people in the room and whatever. And um, he, sh he fairly shouted it. He said, I refuse to suffer for Jesus. And I just was like, whoa, you know, because that's not, that's not, that's not biblical. That is not, that's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would not say that. And I, uh, I actually did confront that pastor about it. The first time I did was an email and he just didn't respond about it. And then the second time was um, he was returning a book I had loaned him. And I asked him about it. And I said, um, you don't remember saying that, do you? And he said, no, I don't. Because I know that sometimes when demons come through people, they make it so that the person doesn't even remember what happened. And I think that's probably what, I really do think that's probably what happened with him. Is that he probably really didn't remember. But I know he did it. And I never returned to that church again. And then I had to deal with it. It's like, okay, something's really wrong here. And finally the, the uh, what do they call it? The, the scales were lifted from my eyes about that. And I was like, okay, Michelle face the fact. It's very clear in the Bible, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, 
that God doesn't like that. It's not. Women were made for men, and um, it's not. He didn't go for that other stuff. And uh, that was really, really, really hard for me to deal with because um, I had thought that people were just born that way. And then I realized that, well, I'm believing man over God. When, man, when a person would say, I was born transgender or I was born, and I'm not talking about people that were born with different genitals. I know that rarely that will happen. But I'm just talking about people just, they just feel like they're a woman and even though they have a, a physical anatomy of a man and vice versa. They told me oh, they were born that way and I just believed them. And then I realized, well look, I can't even believe myself over God without just putting myself in trouble. So why should I believe other people over God, you know? If he says that it's not, if he created us and um, we aren't born that way, but we are born into sin. And so I can understand that people could be born maybe with that desire. It could be because of uh, genera generational sin through their family. It could be a lot of things, but it doesn't make it natural. It doesn't make it, natural is not the right word, because for us in this world, it's only natural to sin. <laughs> it feels natural to sin until we learn otherwise. Anyhow, I had a lot of trouble with that, and I finally got my head clear about it, and it was really hard for me to... to uh, express to the people I love who identify as some other gender than what they were born as. It was hard for me to tell them because I do love them. And uh, there's one I haven't told, but I don't, I'm just not sure that um, I know I'm, it's, it's a relative that I don't know that I know him well enough to do that. So anyway, it didn't go over real well with anybody that I told, but I just have to be true. I just have to tell the truth. It took me so long in my life to learn the truth. I mean, I was literally 60 years old before I realized that not only Jesus, but the Bible are true. And now we, I live in a generation and in a time where I never thought would happen, where most people don't believe the Bible. I mean, even people who are Christian, who call themselves, who identify as Christian, they don't believe, they don't even read the Bible, much less believe it. And the preachers themselves, they're taught in Bible, they're taught in the Bible college, some of them They'll actually go into Bible college believing the Bible and come out of Bible college not believing the Bible anymore. I believe that's because of the infiltration of, again, the structures set up by the fallen angels, such as the Jesuits. But anyway, they, 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 uh, they're very tricky 